Good evening, friends, and welcome to Pendleville on this lovely spring evening. We are delighted to, my name is John Meyer, I'm the Education Coordinator here at Pendleville, Hill and delighted to welcome you all this evening. Um, we are particularly delighted that we are welcoming also some friends who are seeing and hearing this talk being live streamed. Uh, as a test model tonight. So we are told there are another 15 members of our audience who are remotely plugged into our evening. Um, we are particularly delighted that you've turned out this evening, sacrificing your opportunity to be witnessing the NCAA final game of March Madness. For those of you who are interested, but sacrificing more than myself and our speaker this evening, a Duke alum and a Wisconsin alum. So what, whatever has has dragged you out for this is you're going to be you're going to be wowed by a particularly powerful speaker this evening. We don't like to save our commercials for the middle of the ball game, but to start right out with one, we always like to announce our coming event for this coming first Monday, which this coming Monday in May 4th, the first Monday of May, is the occasion of our, oh, I thought it was on here, the 8th annual, I thought it was, 2015 G. Carey Memorial Lecture that's being offered by Phil Gully. And his title is The Theology of Togetherness, A Quaker Pastor Speaks. Uh, it will be particularly important for you to remember this date and to mark it on your calendars because we are expecting an overflow crowd and registration is required. No cost, but registration is required and the online website um, has opened for registration. So not delay if you wish to hear our Quaker pastor from Indiana, well-known author Philip Gully, in this spot at this time on May 4th. Now for this evening. We are very pleased to have with us um, an old Pendle Hill person, not old, in, not old in years, but old in experience at Pendle Hill, a Pendle Hill resident student. Um, Eileen was also, has been a Pendle Hill teacher for many years during, in our resident program. And I'm thrilled to announce that she will be uh, opening with uh, Matthew Armstead, Michael Donnier, and our own Steve Chase as a faculty member in answering the call to radical faithfulness, which is beginning in a couple of weeks. Um, beyond that, you know that she's a Duke graduate, a mother, and an author of several books. Particularly, we are pleased to uh, let you know that her latest book was going to be the topic of this evening's uh, lecture talk. It still is, but we had an added addition. The book is called Renewable, and it's available for sale at the end of the evening. And I'll remind you of that. And it's about Eileen's spiritual journey from an activist life through motherhood and a call back to the simplicity of Quaker root and how activism in saving the planet has pulled her back into a life of activism through the life of the spirit and the support of the Earth Quaker Action Team Spirit-Led Community. So her topic, because we were in a great position of hearing uh, back in March that PNC Bank, after a five-year strategic campaign of nonviolent direct action, was <clears throat> persuaded to uh, cease its funding of mountaintop removal in Appalachia, 
which is a huge, huge gain for all of us and by, done by a fairly sizable number, a sizable handful. No, <laughs> I haven't heard it yet. So this is going to be woven into um, Eileen's own personal spiritual journey, but it's also the story of a movement and its success. And Eileen will speak out of the silence for approximately 45 minutes or 50 minutes or so, and then we'll, as usual, have opportunity for questions, answers, and comments. So join me in uh, holding Eileen in the light and listening to what she has to say tonight. Thank you. So if you have a Wisconsin alum and a Duke alum working together tonight, I think it's just proof that you know all things are possible. <laughs> As John said, the, the focus of this talk changed a little bit and uh, we put successful into the title as we were finalizing that on the very day that we heard about PNC's change of policy. But as I was preparing and making up the slides, I I felt it was important to put this little preamble of what I'm learning about strategic, successful, and spiritually grounded activism because I, I really have a great sense of humility about this. It's not that I have it all figured out by a long shot, and it's not that Equate has it all figured out. We, me and the group, have been on a very steep learning curve, but my joy and excitement comes from the fact that I feel like I've learned so much in the last few years. And so that's really what I want to focus on sharing, some of the things that I've learned through working with Earthquaker Action Team. Um, the book is about the story of my coming to that work more than what I've actually learned. Um, so I won't talk about that as much, but I'll, I'll begin in the same place, which is the book is partly a story about being in despair about the state of the world and feeling stuck and feeling powerless. Just curious how many people have ever felt like that about the state of the world. Okay, so you're my audience, you understand. Um, and part of it had to do with feeling stuck in guilt. When I came to Pendle Hill as a student in 1992, I could fit all of my possessions in my Honda Civic. I unloaded into Chase, you know, everything fit easily in one room. Before that, I had been in the Peace Corps in Botswana, and I lived in a mud hut. Uh, no electricity, no running water, loved it. And here I was in my late 40s with a big house, two cars, two teenagers, kids in schools where they had to have laptops, and feeling way more mainstream than I ever thought I would when I was in my 20s. And so part of the story is about trying to figure out how did I get sucked in to that level of consumption? How did I um, lose touch with some of the things that had been so important to me earlier in my life? And uh, it's also a story of then what helped me kind of um, get my groove back, so to speak. <laughs> I want to start um, here by just talking about the climate change piece, which was that the more I learned about climate change and the inequality embedded in it, um, the more upsetting it was. This is um, a little hard to see. It's a few years old, but the top graphic um, demonstrates the amount of carbon um, emitted per person, I believe, per, you know, in a country. It shows you know, how disproportionate the US's 
carbon impact is. This is a few years old. China's probably a little bigger by now. Um, but the bottom graph shows mortality of who is predicted to die as a result of climate change. And that was the picture that really impacted me, especially because I had been in the Peace Corps in Botswana in southern Africa. And uh, I had stayed in touch with one friend and was talking to her on the phone one day and said, you know, it was winter here, so I knew it was summer there. And I said, well, is it hot? And she said, oh my god, it's 45 degrees. Now you can see <laughs> who understands Celsius, right? And I'm going like, that sounds really hot. So I got off, I googled, that's 113 Fahrenheit. I started reading about climate change in Botswana, and I read that um, it's sometimes so hot that the rain isn't absorbed by the soil when the rains finally come. I went back, uh, this is the school where I taught in the 1980s, I went back in 2012 and learned that my village runs out of water for days at a time now. Uh, back in the 80s, people didn't have running water in their houses, they had pit latrines. Now everybody has a flush toilet, but not water. Um, and everyone I spoke to in southern Africa knew it was climate change. They may or may not have known that term. They may not have understood that top part of that graph about our contribution to it. But every single person I talked to said the weather's getting weird, the rain doesn't come when it's supposed to, the maize crops are terrible. So this added to my despair, right? Learning um, some of this and um, and another thing that, in hindsight, I think contributed to it was being part of a lot of activism that didn't actually stop injustice. I went to so many anti-war things, and we never stopped the wars, right? Um, now, I don't know if anybody knows anyone in this picture. I want to make it clear I'm not making fun of these people, because I am these people. I googled Quaker Vigil, and this is the picture I got. Um, but I had, I had participated in a lot of things that were meaningful as a witness, I think. They were meaningful in terms of the inner experience of a protester showing up and saying, I have to show I disagree with what's happening. That's, I think, the value of this kind of activism as a spiritual practice almost. But it doesn't actually change the policy of the Pentagon, especially if you're on a small side street in Oregon, which is where these folks were. They were faithful. They've done this for years. Um, but it, it was a witness. So a, a turning point came in 2011 at the Philadelphia Flower Show. Um, I had this really strong intuition, maybe you'd say a leading using Quaker language, to go to the Flower Show this particular Wednesday. And I called a friend, she wasn't available. I called another friend, she wasn't available. So I, I just kept feeling I need to go on Wednesday. And I'm walking through the crowd and feeling kind of grumpy because it's really crowded. Do, do any of you go to the flower show? It's like expensive and it's crowded. And it's like tulips planted inside a convention center. It's kind of you know strange. So I was like, why am I here? And I ran into Walter Delt Sullivan former dean of Pendle Hill, acting very furtive. And Walter said to me, come to the PNC pavilion at noon. Pray for us. Leave if the police tell you to. And he like disappeared into the crowd. <laughs> and I was like, this might be Earthquake Action Team. Because I had heard about this wacky little group, right? that had um, formed around the idea of using nonviolent direct action to work on climate change issues. I had heard that they had picked PNC Bank to be their first target because PNC had Quaker roots. It bragged a lot about being a green bank while being one of the top financers of mountaintop removal coal mining, which is a horrible practice which causes climate change and cancer and birth defects for people who live near the mountains 
uh, in Appalachia. So I kind of vaguely knew this group was doing this stuff, and then it kind of dawned on me, PNC was a major financer of the flower show. And so that's why these folks were here. So I had just enough time to go see the bonsai exhibit and then come back to this scene um, of people singing, where have all the flowers gone in the middle of the flower show? And that is really just something that I Now I'm going to pause for a minute in talking to just open a little uh, observation from you all. Um, I want to compare these two pictures, the, the folks at the vigil and um, a picture of the flower show action. Can people read these? Should I re read them out? So this one says, pray for peace. This one, I love this lady. Green living plus social justice plus oneness equals world peace. That's more or less what I believe. Peace cuts taxes, war is a racket, I forget what the bottom part says, and free private manning with a website. Um, I'm not sure what Jonathan's paper says, but the t-shirts say flower crimes division. <laughs> Now, what do you think are the differences that you can observe just from these photographs about these two different ways of doing activism? John. Well, one, they're wearing all the same message, and they're in the middle of something else. OK, so those are two different things. What's the effect of everyone having the same message? You're clear what they're saying, but they're all together, they're saying the same thing. Right. Okay. And it's an organized group rather than just sort of stray odd people. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, it's also that sense of place, I mean, in the, in the flower show version, I mean, they're, they're, they're right in the middle of the action, so to speak, that are not on a side street in a village where people are probably driving by saying, yeah, that was uh -huh. um, This is, it's confrontational, but in a not by the way. Uh -huh. yeah. Other observations? Steve. It looks like a police looking tape. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's what it is or not, but that's a powerful <laughs> message. And I'm pretty sure we put that up. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say Amy probably yeah. knows. Um, but it was an attention getter. Yeah. Yeah. So Go ahead, Amy. Just the context of the, the story of the action was the flower crimes division was coming to confront PNC and see about their crime against me. Right. And so, yes, the police and the police, we broke off their exhibit with police were there to, um, not arrest, but to bring the action to the So on the one hand, the one group is waiting for people to come to them. The equate group is taking you to their cards. So mm -hmm. that's what it's in the amount that comes to them. Right. Go ahead. I love the element of surprise. OK. Yep. I love the element of humor. Mm -hmm. that, that one, um, I have a sense of, oh, there they go again. And the other is like, what the heck are they doing? This is really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think that combination of things also helps us to get more media. Both the fact that there's an element of surprise. Um, the press, I actually, I found this because there was a newspaper story, but it was in nine years. The, the story was about the fact that these people had been out there for nine years. Uh, they certainly weren't getting regular media. Doing something surprising is more likely. Plus the fact that we were someplace that the media was already covering. Not only did PNC have a presence there and there was an audience there, but there was media there as well, or at least covering the flower show story. Any other things people want to point out? Uh, somebody said they're unified in their, in their message, but I'm not, it's not totally clear to me what the message is, which is kind of Right. 
Right. Great. Steve? The first one seems sort of static, people just standing there. And here I'm imagining that there is a whole element of, of street theater and there's a beginning and middle on it and it is more carefully crafted and choreographed. Yeah, I think for a lot of their actions um, there is. I'm not quite sure with this action if that was true. This was actually a civil disobedience action um, where people were willing to stay and risk being arrested the demand, I believe, was that the regional president of PNC come down to the flower show. The Philadelphia police were clear they did not want to arrest us that day, so that did not happen. But um, there was probably more standing still in that action than the ones that you've seen since. Yes, yes, we love to sing. Um, okay, great. So this difference uh, for me as a participant is the difference between despair and hope because it includes a belief that we can actually change decision makers, right? Um, so we're in front of the PNC pavilion, and we know that even if the regional president does not come down to the Florida show, he is definitely going to hear about the fact that we were there and be impacted by our action. So what I wanted to do was talk about some of the things I've learned from doing this kind of work that I think um, have been part of what have made us effective and my hope is that whatever kind of work people here are doing it can relate to that. Of course I'd love it if you all join Equate or write us checks, that's always welcome, but no matter what issue you have, um, this kind of um, idea of picking one strategic target seems so obvious to me now, and yet I was one of those people who showed up for the anti-war march, who showed up for the anti-gun violence march, who showed up for this, who showed up for that, and jumped around depending on what was in the news, which frankly a lot of us have done, right? And it's understandable because there are so many important issues, um, but the idea of picking one and focusing on it has made me feel much more hopeful about actually making a difference. Um, I already explained why uh, Earthquake Action Team picked PNC on top removal. Here's a picture of mountaintop removal coal mining. People have said the idea of a clear message. Um, this is our very last action in the BLAM campaign, and it had a Valentine's Day theme because. Um, it was in February in conjunction with something called I Love Mountains Day, which is organized by people in Appalachia. And we wanted to show solidarity with them, so we picked up this Valentine's theme. Um, we had a lot of red, and we sang really great songs like Stop in the Name of Love Before You Blow It Up. And we, one of the best meeting I've ever been to, I think we rewrote song lyrics. <laughs> Which relates to the creativity thing, and there's this uh, Pendle Hill troublemaker over in this corner. Um, this was an action in New York around, right before the People's Climate March, where we picked up the theme of the United Nations, which was part of the idea of having that march in New York, was uh, because the UN Climate Summit was just about to begin. It turns out that the UN actually sent representatives to West Virginia not that long ago to investigate mountaintop removal coal mining as a human rights abuse. And they had written about how horrible this practice is, how activists against it in Appalachia received death threats. And so we wanted to connect that bigger story of the United Nations. Uh, and so we had our own human, uh, human climate investigators. Um, going into two PNC branches in New York and looking for evidence of the financing of mountaintop removal. Um, so it, there is something called action logic, where you try to make the creativity that you use make sense in the context of what you're trying to do. Um, this picture, I, I love the story behind this. It was from an event called Power Shift. I don't know how many people know Power Shift. It's a global gathering of youth concerned with climate change. Um, many of them college students, but not all. 
And in 2013, the National Power Shift Gathering very conveniently decided to have um, their conference or gathering in Pittsburgh, which happens to be the headquarters of PNC Bank. So we thought that was fortuitous. And we decided to organize what at that time was the largest bank branch action ever that we had ever heard of anyway, which was 16 different actions in one day. One of them was at Temple, and the other 15 were in Pittsburgh. Because we wanted to, um, we wanted to model nonviolent direct action. We wanted to have a way for uh, the students there to participate with us. And at the end of the day, this was kind of a rally outside the last action. And um, what I love about this story is that Matthew Armstead, our coordinator, who, as John mentioned, is part of the core faculty for the Answering the Call to Radical Faithfulness program. Matthew is really great at helping other people shine. And so he had the megaphone, and he just said, Lena, why don't you take the megaphone? Um, Lena is one of our board members. She's a recent Vermont grad. And Lena just took the megaphone and started speaking about why we were there and what the issue was about. And what was interesting about it was that afterward, a member of a different kind of organization, um, someone who's an organizer for a, another environmental group, asked three different times, you mean Matthew just handed someone else the megaphone? You mean he just like handed someone else the megaphone? <laughs> he asked me, he asked Matthew, he asked someone else. And what struck me was how normal that seemed to us and how odd it seemed to him because he's from that kind of an organization where the executive director has the megaphone and then passes it to the executive director of another organization and passes it to somebody else who's got a prepared speech. And I think part of what has worked for us and what has helped us to recruit and keep young people who are an amazing part of our leadership team is letting everyone shine, trying on the thing that everybody is good at, and Lena is really good at this thing. Um, and it also, I think, relates to our kind of Quaker sense of anyone can be moved to speak. Anyone has access to the truth. And um, so I just love that picture and that story because I think it captures something of what we're trying to uh, experiment with doing. Um, of course, if you're going to ask people to stretch and do new things, you have to support them. And um, I love this picture because this was after my first arrest. Um, this is my support team greeting me at the <laughs> exit of the Anacostia police station. Um, but I, I think that's also something that I haven't always experienced uh, in activism. There's the needing to rely on other people to do work, but you can't do it in a way that helps that person to grow in fullness. There's a real kind of trick there. Um, part of the stretching, one of the things I'm coming to understand is the importance of being willing to sacrifice. That's something that I believe Gandhi and King both really understood the power of that. And so, um, I, as I was preparing this, I'm aware that I can talk about it as if we're all fun. You know, we're all we're singing great songs and we're having a good time. But there is an element of it too that uh, can be that you're giving something up, you know, time with your family. Um, if someone is risking arrest, you never exactly know how that's going to go. Um, the two times I've committed civil disobedience have been relatively simple, or I was out relatively quickly. Um, but the idea of that is, is to demonstrate how serious something is. It's serious enough that I'm willing to give something up to make the point, uh, if that makes sense. So this picture was from uh, a fast that we did in 2013 and it was specifically at a time when we were preparing for 
to do something scary for the group, which I'll tell you about in a second. Uh, but we knew this scary thing was coming, and we were sort of in between big actions and decided to do this fasting as a big action. And we asked lots of people to participate in whatever way they were able. Um, Walter did a seven day fast for Appalachia. I would never in a million years be the person to sign up for that. I hate fasting. I hate fasting. It's horrible. It's really hard for me. Some people can do it easily. I did it for two days and I was so um, not you know, full of inner peace. <laughs> Some, I'm like looking at the gummy beer vitamin and wondering like, is that cheating? Um, but, but there was something about doing it with other people that actually made it much easier. Other times I've tried to fast, like I couldn't do it. Um, and, and so it made me think about these transitions that I think we really need to make as a society to have a just and sustainable society. Uh, economy are going to be hard. I'm not exactly sure what it's going to look like, but stretching that muscle of doing something hard with support of other people feels like an important part of the learning. Um, George Lakey has also observed that being willing to sacrifice helps bring in other people, helps build compassion, um, helps people understand how serious an issue it is. Um, which was part of his argument when we walked across Pennsylvania in 2002. Um, George was one of the two people who did all 200 miles of the walk. And, and you know, Amy's here, she did days, several days. I did, you know, the very beginning and the very end. Um, but that willingness to, to um, sacrifice again was something that kind of caught people's attention along the way. As well as the people you're trying to change, they notice uh, what you're doing. Another thing that's been really interesting, I think, in the, um, the last couple of years especially, there have been a number of actions where we've um, kind of been experimenting with worship and combining worship and direct action. And, um, this was the last action in that 16 during the power shift. The first 15 were not arrestable actions. Um, we were certainly not set up to handle that. And we wanted to figure out easy ways for students to participate who might not get a lot of training. Um, my sense is that in the early years of Equate, there was lots of training for every action because everybody was pretty new at it. But as we grew, we had more people kind of jumping in at the last minute. And one of the ideas that emerged was having meeting for worship in bank lobbies. Uh, and so on this day at Power Shift, the first, 10, the first 14 actions were called silent occupations, <laughs> where people uh, went in, some small groups, some larger groups. Um, in many cases, they sat on the floor and had meeting for worship in the middle of the bank lobby. Um, and many people have described this as a really powerful experience of worship. Uh, it really puts you out of your comfort zone into trusting whatever it is you believe is out there or in there, however you think of it. <laughs> um, it's a little riskier than um, the mass benches and um, I'm wondering, Amy, I don't know. I don't want to put you on this spot. Do you want to tell the story of what happened inside, or should I tell my version? You were there, obviously, and I wasn't inside. Um, I'm thinking of Michael's ministry and stopping the crowd. Yeah, I, I want to hear what you want to say about it, but I can say that Michael Lange was really the person that called us to worship. There were seven of us that um, that were willing to stay and risk the rest in this one last big um, lobby and um, this picture can't show it, but it was a huge lobby and with, with a second floor and people just gathered. Um, they had locked the building down and um, people who were trying to get in and out were basically stuck in there with us. And it was getting a little bit agitated and people were, um, we weren't afraid but others were. <laughs> um, we could feel it. So Michael just kind of called us to worship and asked from the heart um, about why we were there and why we felt the Spirit was calling. 
calling us to um, take a stand, and invited every single person in the lobby, including police, security, PNC execs, and just average people who have to be there, to um, work with us in silence and really think about what it was we were calling for. And silence descended. It was incredibly dramatic and moving. Um, <laughs> And but I don't know what the perspective was coming out of that. So well, that's, that's the story I've heard. So thank you. Um, that's the story I've been repeating. And, and the only other part that I've told about it, which just feels interesting to me, is that down the street, uh, because it was the last day of power shift, there was another group committing civil disobedience at the same time around fracking. And they were occupying, I think, a municipal building. And the story I heard was that they had 50 people who really wanted to get arrested, who were like chanting and kind of loud and boisterous. And the police often don't want to arrest you. I mean, it's kind of a pain in the neck for them, right? Um, and so they were up there a really long time and never actually got arrested. For us, the point is not that we want to get arrested. It's not that we're trying to get arrested. But we're willing to get arrested if that's what it takes to make this point. We also have noticed that when we are arrested, we're way more likely to be in the newspaper. But <laughs> that is not the primary point. But what was interesting to me partly about this story is that I had heard about this powerful call to worship, this silence that descended, the police participated. And after the worship was ended, the police arrested them. They're like, we don't know what to do with these people. <laughs> and my interpretation of it is that, that that was more powerful. Michael calling the crowd to pray about what we're doing to the earth was way more scary than 50 people shouting down the street. That's, that's my take on that. Uh, and my last kind of learning, which I've, you know, been learning for 20 years, I guess, is to trust way opening. I'm not sure how many people here are not Quaker and don't know um, this terminology, but it, way opening refers to those experiences of feeling like something has happened in such a kind of miraculous way that maybe we're getting, you know, help from a higher power or you might call it synchronicity um, if you are less comfortable with God language. But this particular story starts about a year and a half ago, <clears throat> after maybe more than that. Um, there were a group of young teen friends from Florida who led a protest at FDC, um, the National Quaker Gathering, in 2013. And they led a protest around uh, fair food um, against communities and got a lot of people ex excited. And afterward, uh, Laura Melly, who's a member of my meeting and also connected with Pendle Hill, sent me an email and said, I just think you need to be in touch with these Quaker teenagers in Florida. Some of them really feel led to work with a Quake. And I said, like, OK. I don't really know what to do with Quaker teenagers in Florida, but OK, I'll email. Uh, and so we started this exchange. <clears throat> one, of, uh, one of these young friends, Jocelyn, got a minute from the yearly meeting to go to Appalachia and see mountaintop removal coal mining. And um, you know, we stayed in touch about that. Now, that, the way over part has to do with the PNC shareholder meeting. And that's the scary thing that we were getting ready for in 2013. We had decided that we, we had been visiting the PNC shareholder meeting relatively quietly for a couple of years. And in 2013, our campaign had been going on a bit. We realized we wanted to actually challenge the decision makers in a very real way. And so in that shareholder meeting, um, a number of our people went in had their own meeting for worship, and then one by one stood up to speak, even while their business meeting was going on. And people sang the old union song, Which Side Are You On?, to each member of the PNC board. The CEO was furious, 
and shut the meeting down in 17 minutes uh, rather than arrest people. It was another situation where people were willing to risk arrest, which we don't do all the time, but it had to be the most dramatic story. So they shut their own meeting down rather than let us continue or arrest us. So that was 2013. We were trying to decide what are we going to do in 2014. We don't want to do the same thing not as well. Um, we had more or less decided we probably wouldn't even go to the shareholder meeting until they decided to move it to get away from us. And where do you think they moved it? Florida, where there are all these great young people who can't wait to do something, right? So they were going to go to Tampa. Uh, and by the way, in Florida, it's illegal to interrupt a meeting. It's illegal to hold up a sign in a meeting. It's illegal to do a lot in Florida, which seemed like maybe not a coincidence. They also issued a very long list of things you, you couldn't do, including bring in cell phones. They had high security. They confiscated everybody's cell phones. They were clearly really scared about what we were going to do. And the amazing thing about the timing was that um, the yearly meeting for Southeast Asian yearly meeting was the weekend before the shareholder meeting. So here, all these people were gathered together anyway. The national group, some of us, offered us money to fly a few people down to do a training. And here they all are making signs for the shareholder action, which uh, ended up bringing together Quakers of all ages from seven different monthly meetings who afterward, uh, this was our debrief at Panera, said that they had never actually done anything before together from seven different monthly meetings around Florida. And wasn't this great that they were doing something together? Uh, and I'll just say real quickly, these different teachers were the people who were supposed to go into the shareholder meeting. What we decided to do since, since these meeting worships had been very powerful, um, we figured, well, it's not illegal to pray in Florida. So, <laughs> hmm? <laughs> right. So wouldn't it look really bad if they arrested us for praying in Florida? So, um, we were not risking arrest during that action, but what we decided to do was send a few people in with these t-shirts. We had business jackets over it. And then uh, we would stand up and take them off and just have silent prayer in the middle of their meeting. Um, it turned out that they found a technicality in the proxies, the paperwork you need to get into a shareholder meeting. So they ended up excluding everybody but me. I was the only person who got into the meeting. And um, I had to figure out when to stand up or what to do because I had assumed that someone would be with me. And I had made a big deal out of if we're going to do this, we have to really pray. We, we can't like do a skit of praying, like it has to be genuine. Uh, but I actually don't feel like I'm that good at praying, you know? Like even though I've written a book, Serenity Prayer and stuff, I was like, <laughs> why am I here? <laughs> um, but in that moment when I was in there by myself and I did stand up, um, I felt so part of the group. I felt so held by the group. All the other people who were supposed to come in, including some of the teenagers, took off their jackets outside and had meetings for work in the lobby um, so that people had to pass them on their way out. And um, it was one of those things that I definitely would not have felt comfortable doing a few years ago, but this experience of acting boldly with this group and feeling held by the whole um, was really with me. And they shut the meeting down in 15 minutes that time. But they, they had raced through their agenda. Um, so part of what happened uh, was that that group of teenagers in Florida enlivened FGC gathering, I think. There were lots of people who did hard work at gathering, so it wasn't just that. But they came in, and some of the, the same ones there, they're still wearing their same t-shirts um, from the shareholder meeting, 
were so excited they stopped and they saw a mountaintop removal on their way up to Pittsburgh, which, by the way, again, uh, gathering happened to be in Pittsburgh that year. And so this was 200 uh, acres from around the country who got on buses and came to downtown Pittsburgh um, to do an action during gathering. Uh, again, many of them included meeting for worship. And then many of those people went back to their own community and developed their own actions for December 6th. Uh, and I just have <laughs> the Florida again. Um, the, the same uh, two sisters. Uh, Kate, who is a high school student, is the leader of this particular action in Sarasota. But there were 31 actions that day, um, many of them led by people who had never done anything like this before, some of them teenagers, and um, 300 people that we know of who participated. Uh, and lots of pictures of people worshiping around the country in different kinds of clothes, you know, based on the weather, which was kind of fun to see. I'm going to end um, by reading a little bit of the book, but I'll say that part of what's made me much more optimistic um, about our capacity to change is my sense that this way opening this and enlivening is happening actually all around the world. Um, and that what I'm experiencing is not unique at all. I'm not sure that we're actually going to make the kind of changes that we need to make to prevent catastrophic climate change. I don't know, but I feel more, more hopeful because I see more and more people stepping forward and doing it, uh, and challenging the institutions. Uh, so I'm going to end with um, the Forward on Climate Rally. This was not chronological, by the way. Um, the Forward on Climate Rally is where the book ends. And so I'm just going to read the last two pages of the book. I'm just curious, how many people were there? Are you here? Great. Um, this was, at the time, the largest climate change rally in history. Uh, the People's Climate March, less than two years later, was 10 times the size. But this was 40,000 people on a very, very cold day in Washington. Unbelievably cold. Good thing we believe in sacrifice. Um, so I'm just going to end with a little bit from the book and then open it up to questions or comments. We all stood in the bitter wind, huddled together, listening to speeches as we waited to start our slow march around the White House. A shivering Bill McKibben said he'd waited 25 years to see a movement gathered to fight climate change. And now I've seen it, he declared. Other environmental and political leaders took the stage. The most moving for me were the indigenous women who together filled the giant screens that projected their images to the crowd. Draped in red with a leather headband, Jackie Thomas, chief and elder of one of Canada's First Nations people, told the story of her group's work. We formed an alliance to stop the Enbridge Northern Gateway Project, which plans to bring tar sands oil to the coast of British Columbia which will then be put on tankers to be put on the Asian markets, she explained. She talked about the mysterious cancers killing people who live near the tar sands and the danger of oil spills. She listed places in the United States and Canada where there had already been dangerous oil accidents. Kalamazoo, Alberta, the Northwest Territories, the Gulf of Mexico. We are all connected, she said, reminding us that ranchers depended on the same water as indigenous people. Enbridge has really brought our communities together in Canada. Never before in my life have I seen white and native work together before now. The crowd cheered. Wow, said George, turning to me with his white eyebrows raised below his yellow hood. This is the first time in her life she's seen Native people and white people working together. 
Thank you, Enbridge, for doing this work for me, continued Thomas, and the crowd laughed. As she concluded, she reiterated, for the first time in my life, I feel like there is support of many. We can stand before big oil, not just for my people, but for your people. The connection of all life, human and animal, ran through the speeches of the First Nations women, who spoke of their obligation to their children, their ancestors, and to their one true mother. It seemed so simple, so obvious, that we humans were interdependent, finding our humanity in each other, as well as our survival. Of course we all drank the same water. Later, after the march, I would learn that the fight against Keystone had launched a cowboy-Indian alliance along the pipeline's route, reminding me of the South African alliance against fracking. I would learn of other places, too, where small numbers of historic adversaries were recognizing that their common interests outweighed that which divided them. I would plant my hope in these stories. This vision of human beings recognizing our universal oneness would, in the coming year, inspire me to become a vegetarian, to reduce my carbon footprint, a sacrifice that felt much easier once I was living in hope rather than despair. It would motivate me to keep speaking about climate change in Africa and keep organizing. In just over a year, I would be one of the main planners and trainers of the action that led to my second arrest, where even police joined in a silent prayer for all our children's futures. I would continue growing alongside Equate and the water movement, which less than two years after the cold forward on the climate march, would gather 10 times the crowd in the streets of Manhattan with indigenous people from around the world leading the march. But that was all in the future. Standing in the bitter February wind between 16-year-old Megan, my daughter, and 75-year-old George, Blakey, I remembered George's comment. We need to have the experience of being the many. And I realized that was part of what had changed for me over the course of the past year. When I had cried in my three-story house the previous winter, I had felt alone. Now I didn't. I knew I was part of the many, connected to a spiritual force greater than ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Do we have some questions from the audience? And if you would wait until I bring the microphone to you, and if you put it right where I'm putting it, you will be heard. Do you want to call on folks? You're the only one. So. I, this uh, came to me when you were talking about the uh, shareholders meetings. And I was wondering whether any of the team prepared for that by buying a share of stock to ensure the right to speak, even in Florida. I mean, it's an old Ralph Nader uh, technique, and I just wondered if that was part of the, the tactical preparation. A, a few people did buy shares. We also had friends who already owned shares. So the reason that I was able to get into the meeting was there was actually a monthly meeting that owned a considerable amount of shares and had purchased it a different way which was how I got around the technicality. But some people did buy one or two shares. Could I ask you to um, mention December 6th, 2014, and why that date was chosen? I don't remember why that date was chosen. Oh. <laughs> well, it was on your slide. I thought there was a significance, as there was to most yeah. of the things that you were doing. There was a, an element of tying it together. Well, I think it was more flow. We had we do have regular strategy sessions 
and we had had a strategy session, I can't remember when it took place, where we imagined what we wanted to come out of FGC gathering. We knew that that was an opportunity to connect with Quakers from all around the country. And so in our, we call it a strategy arc, the arc was kind of organizing people leading up to this big event. And then um, we wanted to figure out where were the clusters of people. Because one of the big learnings is you can't do this alone, right? So if you're the only friend excited about direct action in Scranton, you're going to need to either recruit other people or drive or just send a check or, you know. Uh, so we wanted to figure out where are the clusters because that will be the easiest place. And so we took the names of people who participated with us at gathering and Matthew made a huge map in his living room and figured out where they all lived. And, you know, some of them didn't know each other. <laughs> some of them did. But all these Florida friends didn't necessarily know each other as well as they do now. Um, so we identified places where there seemed like there might be blood link interest, and then we had four regional trainings. Uh, so we went to Indiana, Florida, uh, Philadelphia, and I forget where the other one was. Um, and then invited people to come who would then go out. So I think December was... The, the soonest time, you know, we wanted to do it before Christmas, before college students go home to someplace else. Um, so we wanted to do it before the end of the year, but that was sort of the soonest that we could get in all the training necessary to encourage people who had never led an action before to go do that. Does that make sense? Hmm. It, yeah, that was just an accident, I think. <laughs> go ahead. Bring us to uh, 2015, there's uh, clearly a, a victory with the PNC. Um, what do you anticipate is the next focus? Yes. Um, it's very exciting that everyone is asking that. Um, we're undergoing a discernment process. We have a sense of both leisure and urgency. Uh, so we want to take our time in thinking that through, and uh, we also realize there are pressing issues. So we're having a couple of gatherings where people are brainstorming kind of what are the core values that we have, what are the strengths that we have, and frankly, a lot of people are emailing us ideas of what they think we should do, and um, we're taking a few and kind of fleshing them out and doing research. and trying to imagine how we could actually do something strategically. So that might be a great issue, but who would we be trying to target? Where are they? What would be any special leverage? Could people around the country participate, or is it focused on one region? So we're asking lots of questions. And we'll let you know when we figure out what it is. I just know that um, Kate, whom you mentioned as a leader, yes. she and her family were here at Pendle Hill for a year. And I don't know whether we should take credit for that, but I know their family has <laughs> tutored them in activism. Yes. I'm just a little curious about the logistics of when, when you were in the lobby, when it resulted in arrest. What were you actually arrested for? Uh, well, I think that time was probably trespass. Um, yeah. I mean, all of, um, did I just mess up the mic? I think that there are some kinds of civil disobedience that actually are interrupting injustice. So if you think of the lunch counter incidents in the 1960s and the civil rights movement, um, if it was illegal for a black person to order a cup of coffee, and a black person went and sat down and ordered a cup of coffee, they were creating a dilemma for the system, right? They either had to serve that person a cup of coffee, or arrest them for breaking the law, or try and wait them out. So there's some civil disobedience that actually is um, dramatic in that way, because it's really confronting an unjust law. 
I think one of the challenges of this campaign is that money moves electronically. And so there wasn't really any way for us to stop PNC from lending money to companies engaged in this practice, but we could disrupt their business in visible ways. And so that's what, in this case, a lot, most often, I think, the chargers were trespassing. It was refusing to leave once we were asked. There were lots of times when we went into banks, had worship, you know, had a powerful presence in some way, but then left before um, before it got to the point where the police would arrest us. Any other questions? Uh, just to continue on that, what's involved in being arrested? What do you prepare for? What are the consequences? Yeah. Um, so this sounds like a dodge, but the truthful answer is it depends. It depends on where you are. It depends on, depends on what you're doing. Um, so in the story that Amy told where they were arrested in Pittsburgh, they received much higher was it bail or fines? Uh, both. Both. Um, really high bail, like five times higher than we expected. And we have been told that Pittsburgh is very friendly to activists. There are only two judges who really hate activists. And then, you know, <laughs> we, we got one of them. I'll be a Uh huh. Part of the rationalization for really super high bail on a very minor charge. If you're in Pittsburgh, when you've been arrested, it's been a little less. You mean Philadelphia? I mean Philadelphia. Yeah. It, it does depend. So the two times I was, I'll just give my own experience. The first time was in a very highly orchestrated act of civil disobedience in front of the White House, and in fact, that's the story that starts the book. It was like 47 famous people and me. It was like Daryl Hannah and Robert Kennedy Jr. and Bill McKibben. And this was like as smooth an experience as you could possibly have. It was really worked out ahead of time. We knew that we would almost certainly be released that day. We knew that it would be a $100 fine and that we should bring cash with us. We knew that no one was planning to not pay the fine. Um, and so that is not the normal situation. Um, the second time I was arrested was in front of the federal building. Um, it was, it was asked by a national movement to um, organize an action around the Keystone XL pipeline. And in that situation, it wasn't clear if we would be arrested you know, under federal charges or by local Philadelphia police. So there were lots of different things that could have happened Again, they didn't really want to keep us in jail, you know. Uh, so we were released by the end of the day, but again with higher fines than we expected. Um, and we read it as they were trying to discourage. There were lots of groups around the country that had pledged to do civil disobedience around Keystone, and we were supposed to be kind of like a warning shot. And so we had, was that 350? $350 fine, and we had been told 100 you know, is the most it'll be. Yes, right. <laughs> so, um, this is a little bit, this is a little bit off topic from the, the question of arrests. One of the things as an activist that's active mostly on social justice issues mm -hmm. is that I think in some cases there's a perception that there's a division in between environmental justice and social justice activists. Mm -hmm. And I think that part of that perception I think comes in terms of, and I, I'd, I'd be curious, I'm asking because I'm curious about your thoughts about this. I think from the social justice side it's the perception that the one target kind of being really active around environmental and all this stuff, you can get a whole bunch of people to get out and be active around nature, but not care about human problems. Um, and basically us saying that like, okay, so you have all these people coming out and marching about Black Lives Matter and all this stuff, but like, 
that's important, but we don't see the people who are active on mountaintop coal mine removal coming over and also talking about Black Lives Matter. Because, because there's the division there because you want one target, focused message, all of that stuff, which is important because you need to amplify your meaning message, but it means that a lot of folks feel like you guys are also just leaving other struggles out in the cold. So I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Sure. Um, I, I think that there's a lot of truth in what you say about those dynamics. I also have a sense, I don't, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm in my bubble of those things shifting. A lot of our people showed up to Black Lives Matter's protests. We didn't, as an organization, take it on as a campaign, but we showed up to support those movements. Um, and one of the ways that we showed up was we, we had been thinking about this because economic justice or, is part of our mission statement. I didn't say that, and maybe I should have, that uh, when it was founded, the mission statement is to use nonviolent direct action to work for a just and sustainable economy. And so part of the choice of mountaintop removal was recognizing that Appalachia is one of the poorest parts of the United States, a, a region that has been exploited for a long time, um, and where people had an ongoing struggle that we could be in solidarity with. So one of the things we'll look for when we're choosing a next campaign is that intersection of feeling like it's a justice issue. Um, and in fact, in, in our writing about mountaintop removal, I think we almost, we spoke a lot about people in Appalachia and cancer and that kind of exploitation. And I felt like I was often the person saying like, and don't forget to mention it causes climate change. Because part of what brought me into this work was the global injustice of climate change. Um, the, uh, I'll tell one other story that I don't um, talk about a lot, which was that when the Black Lives Matter campaign started, um, Training for Change, I don't know how pe many people know, a Philadelphia-based organization that Matthew Armstead, our coordinator, works with as well. Uh, they got a request for trainers of color to go to Ferguson who were experienced in nonviolent direct action. And when Matthew first got the request, he said, yeah, <laughs> not me. I don't want to do that. And then as he read over what they were looking for, he was like, oh, that's me, that's me, that's me. Uh, and he really felt called to go to Ferguson and came to um, the executive committee of the board and said, I think I'm called to do this, but I work for you guys and I can't afford to quit my job and I can't afford to go unless you pay me. And so we, I was really proud of our board in that moment. We decided really pretty quickly um, that we were in unity with sending Matthew. That's what we could do. It didn't make sense for us all to go to Ferguson. It made a lot of sense for Matthew to go to Ferguson. Uh, and so training for change paid his transportation and we paid his salary. And, but part of the problem that I think you point to is this uh, perception of division and certainly exploitation. I've seen some ways in which I think environmentalists are trying to bridge that, white environmentalists in ways that are really awkward and feel kind of icky sometimes. Um, and we, we didn't want to do that. So we actually haven't told the story about sending Matthew to Ferguson because we didn't want to be that group that brags about what we did. You know what I'm saying? So it's a tricky thing to figure out how, how to do this work. Um, but I thank you for raising the question because I think it's really important that we do try and figure out the ways to connect. I'd like to ask a follow-up question, if I might, since I have the microphone. <laughs> it works for me. I think, and it's related to this particular topic, and that is, as I was when you're talking about being arrested as a voluntary action and we're preparing for the um, end of mass incarceration and the new Jim Crow conference here, um, there, is a, there is a white middle class privilege at play about deciding whether or not you will voluntarily put yourself 
at that risk. And knowing that you have $100 or $350 to draw on to get yourself out. So the strategy, I'm wondering how, how open is the strategic plans that you have for a more broad-based um, movement, both economically and racially. Mm -hmm. So I think that, no, I, I think that you can have a broad-based movement, and that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone has to play every role. I mean, even as it is, like I would say, most people who have acted with Equate have never risked arrest. Um, and we wouldn't encourage someone to do that if they had benchmark warrants. You know, we want them to kind of think through the implications of that, or in any situation where someone might be at higher risk um, because of their medication or anything. I feel like I've learned so much about courage from Matthew, who in that keystone action, you know, here's a young gay African American man who at one point Homeland Security came out and started pushing people, and Matthew is jumping in to defend people. And I felt like that was such a humbling experience for me to watch him do that. Um, so I don't think it's my fault to decide what risk someone else should or shouldn't take, but as a group to support people to discern. Um, the other thing I would say related to risk and civil disobedience, it is really different. The, the action that we do that's not confronting injustice directly. The people who sit in the way of mountaintop removal coal mining or in the way of building the pipeline are way more likely to get pepper sprayed in their face. Uh, so I think it's important to, to say that, that you know, different kinds of action carry different risks. And um, I'm telling my story, uh, but there are lots and lots of other stories out there. Uh, John, I'm gonna let you make the call on when to wrap this up. I know there was at least one other hand. But I'm still standing. The tip-off game is 918, so you can Oh, really? <laughs> did you still have a question? Yeah, I did. Oh, it's over here. Sorry. Yeah, I, um, I have a more maybe cerebral uh, question. What um, have you uh, d tried to figure out what PNC is now doing with the money that they were going to invest in mountaintop mining? And there's a subsidiary question to this, which is, did you have a back channel into PNC? And was there somebody at PNC who was telling you, oh, you know, PNC is thinking about doing this, or some, you know, some person who was an employee of PNC, or a group, or not a number of them, who would say, oh, you know, here's some background information. Um, okay, so on the second question, no, we don't, we do not have a bowl at PNC, but, but, but we have gotten several signs from PNC that a change is afoot. Um, one of the most dramatic was after the big action in Pittsburgh uh, in July. We also did something that we call spotlighting, which some activists call bird dogging, if people know that term. But players were a little uncomfortable. Bird dogging is sort of going and um, confronting a decision maker. So Rick Santorum had like people throw confetti at him because of his stance on LGBT things while he was running for office kind of going right to a decision maker in a public way is usually how it happens. Um, Quakers being what we are, we didn't like the violence implied in the term bird dogging. So we decided to call it spotlighting, We're shining the spotlight on a decision maker. Um, and one of the ways we did that was we started visiting people in their homes. Uh, it turned out to be really hard to find the CEO of PNC in a public place. Uh, so we went to his home and people had a gift basket with chocolate and a video about our work and information on mountaintop removal coal mining. And it was actually the second time that people had gone to his house on the 4th of July. And he came out in his jogging shorts and talked to them for an hour. His employee came out and said he's not here and then he came out and talked to them for an hour. 
which was just one of several signs that we were clearly getting to So he told us that he reads our blog, he talked about climate change and how he has some kids, and um, so that was a dramatic fun. You know, we've heard stories of, you know, somebody who's a PNC underwriter let slip, oh, we're going to change that policy. Um, in our February action, the head of security said to Ingrid Lakey, well, you know they're negotiating over this, right? You know, so we had lots of signs that a change was coming. Um, That's the kind of contact that I was talking about. Right. We, we also, we also, um, uh, were aware that shareholder groups were having an insider conversation with them. Friends Fiduciary, Boston Commons, and some other groups used their shares to have inside conversation, and we knew that they were raising the issue of mountaintop removal, coal mining as well. Um, I forget what the, oh, what are they doing? So in talking to people who understand business better than I do, I sort of, we had that question, right? If they take it out of coal, what are they gonna put it into? And basically, I was told, like, that's not how bankers think. That's not how it works. It's not like, oh, here, let's take the coal money and put it into fracking. They're completely separate departments and separate people. Um, they are, that said, heavily invested in fracking. Um, one of the things that I'm really excited about that nobody else talks about is that in the report that announced this change in policy, they also announced something that we had heard through the grapevine that they hired someone who specializes in socially responsible and sustainable investment, which to me is a bigger sign in a way of changing one policy. If they're investing in someone who is supposed to consult, who knows what that will mean for other issues, um, but it was something that they announced. And there was a hand over here? Yeah, so that's a nice uh, segue to my question, which is um, you said earlier that um, your new focus has not been determined yet. But I'm wondering what the TAC um, of the equate is towards PNC now. Um, in, in terms of, are you telling people to invest or? Uh, so that's another question we're getting a lot. Um, there are some friends who want to send them a thank you letter and we have decided not to do that. We are sending a thank you letter to the activists in Appalachia who've really been carrying this struggle. Um, we are no longer asking people to remove money from PNC, which we did as part of our campaign. Over $3.6 million were taken out as a result of our campaign. We're not telling people to continue closing their accounts, but we're also not saying, oh, put it all back in, because they are heavily invested in fracking and other things. Um, because we don't know what our next campaign is, we have no idea if PNC will have any, any connection to it or not. So we're, um, we're not doing anything actively with them right now. Can you just say why you decided not to send that thing up to them? Um, I wasn't part of that uh, inside the conversation, um, but I think it was a sense of, like, they're basically doing the right thing. And we are stance. So one of the things that comes up, I find, in conversations with Quakers is um, a, a question about what actually changes things. Did we change their hearts and minds? Or were we just such a pain in the neck that that made them change their policy? And I don't really know, because I'm not in Bill and Jack's mind. Um, but I think that we tend to think <laughs> that if we change people's hearts and minds, that's great, but it's not actually what's gonna make a big institution change their policy. Do you know what I'm saying? And so um, I feel like the desire was to give the credit to people in Appalachia rather than say like, oh, CEO, you're such a great guy for making this policy change, when in fact they were investing in something really horrible. And they haven't said that they will invest in reparations, which is one thing that people have talked about like as a possibility is to ask them, okay, now invest in the green economy in Appalachia. Um, 
some Appalachian activists have said that, that the coal companies actually keep out other industries. It's part of how they keep the political control is by making it hard for other kinds of industries to come in. And um, so just because they've stopped financing this, it doesn't mean that this issue is solved. I mean, we're optimistic that it is part of a wider wave of change in Appalachia, but um, there's a lot more that could be done. Joan, you look like you're burning to say something. I also remember when the report was made, it was really couched in a, um, we're going to test out this new policy. And what I heard, uh, and equate, I think it was Ingrid say, is we don't really know if it's going to last or not, so stay tuned. And um, I mean, we're hoping this will. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons we didn't send the thank you note. Yeah. We, we want to be careful and thoughtful and not just assume that because they said that, it's going to last. Yeah, and just to clarify, I don't think they really said they were testing it out, but they did, they acknowledged health and environmental concerns, but they also acknowledged that their own bottom line is part of it. Right now, coal prices are really low. So if coal prices were to go up, would their concern about the health and environment decrease? Like, we don't know, you know, so we definitely plan on continuing to watch. Amy? Uh, I just want to add, too, that um, the reason that we want to thank the activists in Appalachia is because they are really the reason this campaign was won. Although Equate's strategy and, you know, grassroots efforts probably was the, uh, you know, our obnoxiousness is probably the thing that got, the, got PNC's attention. We were working with thousands and thousands of people in Appalachia who had already had the movement going. Mm -hmm. And so we wouldn't have been able to win this campaign without them. And so they're the people that we want to say thank you to mm -hmm. because they're really why this campaign was won. Mm -hmm. Christy, maybe? Uh, I have a question, but first, in the, the thank you thing, it, what it makes me think of is that when my kids stop hitting each other when they're fighting, I don't thank them that they're not hitting each other <laughs> anymore. <laughs> it feels kind of similar to that. Um, so I'm wondering if you could just share any aspect of how your, your faith has grown or changed as you've, as you've been engaged in this work. Yeah, um, I said to someone um, after I spoke at FGC gathering, an old friend uh, wrote a blog post, Marcel Martin, who used to teach at Pendle Hill, uh, she wrote a blog post and one of the things she said was that she was frustrated that none of the speakers at gathering talked about God, including me. Like, so she was in the front row worshiping with me and holding me in support and um, kind of made this comment after it. And we had this long email exchange about it. And what I said was that I feel like I talk about God less and I experience God more than I did several years ago, uh, especially teaching at Pendle Hill, discerning our call and teaching courses about spirituality and writing about that. I felt like I was talking about God a lot but it kind of grew into this place in my life where I wasn't actually having that experience of being led very often. Um, and I think it's maybe partly because we want to be open to people of all faiths and people of no faith that we don't talk about it a lot, but I think just worshiping and being hobbies uh, or doing things that are more risky, I do have a sense of kind of being held and being part of something much bigger than myself. Um, yeah, and, and a few times of real clarity about what I'm meant to do. Not all the time, <laughs> but sometimes. <laughs> yeah, sure. I think this will be our last question. Um, There's um, 
a Gandhian thing that's happening with this one action that I would invite you to comment on. I'm thinking of uh, Gandhi's sort of principle that we don't want them to leave our enemies, we want them to leave us friends. And by picking a Quaker-based institution, you're in a sense calling them back to their own values and reminding them of things that, I don't know what they said, and if they said, well, we've seen the light and we think that was wrong, I don't know if I would trust it, but if it said we found, you know, we, we, our Quaker roots kind of thing supports this movement, and whether they mean it or not, the opportunity for this, I don't wanna say face-saving, it's deeper than that, um, it's a Gandhian-ish kind of possibility that was created by you choosing a Quaker based institution where the deep values could drive, their deep values could mm -hmm. drive the action that you were calling them to take. And I don't know if that came up in your planning or if that's something you would comment on. I'd love to hear more about that if it's there. Well, I, I am not a historian, so I'm just going to paraphrase um, something I've heard George say, I think, is that one of the differences between Gandhi and King is that Gandhi was more optimistic about actually changing the heart and mind of the oppressor. <laughs> um, I don't think that we, I, I think, um, I've heard people who were founders, which I was not, say that um, the choice of PNC was not so much as I. First of all, they're a huge. They're the seventh largest bank. They earned 4.2 billion dollars last year, and I don't know how many people who work for them are Quaker, but not very many. And it was only a part of the bank that was the Quaker bank which resulted in lots of Quaker institutions having their money there. I think we probably connected with that more than they did. Um, it, Jen looks like she has the answer to this question. <laughs> more than I do, she's going. <laughs> I'll be brief. Um, I do not concede that a corporate entity such as a bank holds values as much as they hold a brand. And I think it was their Quaker brand that Equate was seeking to leverage against and did so successfully. And, and I'll just add that their brand really is a lot about helping people. So maybe some of that did come from the Quaker Roots. I don't know. But they, they do like to promote themselves a lot as good community members. Um, so I, I thank you for that distinction. Are we done? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, you may make an announcement, Nancy. Thank you again very much for all of you coming out. Thank you, Eileen, for delivering a, an inspiring message tonight. Um, I would, and thank you for the folks at home. I think we might even, they might have left already, but. Um, I am also going to invite you to uh, take with you a copy of the flyer for the Stephen G. Carey Memorial Lecture next month, May 4th, same time, 7.30 here, and remind you once again that in order to come in that night, you will need a, to register online, okay? And if you don't wind up registering online, I think it will also be live streamed because that was, a, well, we'll find out whether we had a successful adventure tonight or not, but I'm, I'm counting on it. Eileen? Yes, that's my next thing. But she took my she took my prop. <laughs>
Here is the new book that Eileen has just published. It just came out in the middle of March. And she also has copies of her previous book, The Wisdom to Know the Difference, which is a very inspiring book. I can say that I've read that. I have not yet read the new one, but I can hardly wait to get my own copy. So don't delay. Thank you so much. Have a good evening.